Hi everyone, welcome to this video lecture on bitwise operations for the introductory audio programming module here at UE. In this lecture, we're going to cover binary representation, we're going to cover bitwise manipulation, and the bitwise operators. These are AND or exclusive or not, shift left and shift right. So, what is bitwise manipulation? Bitwise manipulation is a low level feature which is often used in embedded systems and systems programming where software often deals directly with the underlying hardware devices. Furthermore, raw MIDI requires us to use bitwise operations to extract all of its contents, which is why we cover it on this course. Just a quick recap on binary. This is from lecture number six. Humans generally use base 10, decimal, as their numbering system. For each digit, there are 10 possible values. These are 0 through to 9. Once you add 1 to 9, you get 10, i.e. we overflow into the next digit. So the next digit becomes 1, and our current digit, the one we were just using, uh, resets back to 0. However, computers don't tend to work like this. Computers much prefer to work with binary. So in binary, a single digit, i.e. a bit, is either a 1 or a 0, either on or off. By chaining these 1s and zeros together, we can represent numbers. Or more specifically, everything on your computer is ultimately represented in binary. Here's a quick table that demonstrates decimal numbers in their binary representation. We generally work with a group of 8 bits. We refer to this as a byte. A byte can store the range of numbers from 0 to 255. So for example, if we have 8 zeros in a line, this gives us 0. And if we have 8 ones in a line, we get the number 255. A group of 4 bits is referred to as a nibble. Each bit represents a power of 2. So on the right hand side, the lower bit uh, gives us 1, and the highest bit, i.e. bit number 7, will give us 128. We can convert back to decimal using this following routine. So let's say, for example, that we have this binary pattern here, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So starting at the right-hand side, we'd say, well, 1 times 1 is 1, uh, 2 times 0 is 0, 4 times 1 is 4, 8 times 0 is 0, and so forth. And once we get all of these, once we do all of that, we can add all this together to work out what that binary representation is in decimal. In this case, it's 181. Different data types in C++ require different amount of bytes. For example, an int, by st uh, the standard int, uses 4 bytes, or 32 bits. It can store a number in the range roughly minus 2 billion to, to plus 2 billion. The smallest data types, ball and char, use only a single byte, which is the smallest variable size possible. However, what we will see by kind of exploring this lecture is that we can actually address information that's much smaller than that by using these bitwise operations, which we'll come to in just a moment. So remember, all of our variables in our program are represented by groups of 8 bits called bytes. For example, when we set the variable a to have a value of 5, i.e. int a equals 5, what we're actually doing is we're setting the lowest byte of 4, because when we have 4 of them for an integer number, to have the value 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1 in memory. Let's see this in code. If we type the code we just saw on the lecture slide, i.e. int a equals 5, and then place a breakpoint on the line below before we print it, when we run this program, you'll see that, the, that our variable a indeed has the value 5. However, if we right-click on this, we can go view value as binary, and we can see that, in fact, this variable has the, this value in binary. Remember, there's 32 digits because this is a 4-byte number, and we can see at the end we have 0, 1, 0, 1, which is exactly uh, what we had in our, in our lecture slide. Let's now look at some of these bitwise operators. We have previously seen the double less than symbol and the double greater than symbol used as operators for inserting variables into streams. However, these are also used as the bit shift operators. The left shift operator will shift all the bits inside a variable up by a given number of places. For example, int a equals 1, and then we say a equals a shift 1. What, was, what would actually would happen is that a is now equal to 2. So the bit that was representing the 1 was shifted left into the bit representing 2. To see this visually, inside your uh, IAP project, you will find this binary grid application, which is useful for, for kind of visualizing these operations quickly. So let's set this. Let's do this exact example. Let's set this to be one. So this is our. This is imagine this is an eight bit, uh, an eight bit variable with eight obviously eight bits to toggle on and off, and we'll toggle the first bit on so it, the output is one. Use the shift left operator to shift it up. We can now see that it's moved the, the one that was in here to be up here. So now we have two. And of course, we can shift this up as many times as we like. And the right shift operator is the same as the left shift operator. It just works in the other direction. So again, let's see this in code. 
sorry, in, in the binary grid. So if I've toggled the top bit to be 128 and I shift it right one place, sorry, if we shift it right by one place, we'll end up with 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. The general form of the shift looks like this. So the variable, the constant that you wish to shift, and the number of bits that you want to shift it by. And likewise, it's the same formula for the uh, the left shift and the right shift have the exact same syntax other than what they actually end up doing. The thing to note is that it's possible to overflow and shift bits off either end of this. Uh, if you do this, these bits are lost forever. And this behavior, we can again see this in the binary grid application. So if we shift this one, uh, if we shift this number one to the to the right, um, you'll see that it's now lost forever. And if we shift it back left. There is nothing to shift because the bit has been completely lost. Likewise, if we set this bit to be 1 and then we shift left, uh, again, we end up with 0 because the bit has been lost. The left shift and right shift operators are really useful if you want to ever just set an individual bit. Um, so you can use the following to set an individual bit to 1. So in this case, this will set bit number 8, so the topmost bit, to 1, uh, which means it will have the value 128. So let's do this in code. So again, let's create another variable, and this time we'll call this uh, a equals 1 shift 7, which is exactly what we had in the lecture slide. And let's print that out to check that that is now the value 128, which is. So what this means is that first a has the value 1, i.e. remember 1 means that the lowest bit will have the value 1, and then we shift it up by 7 places, so 7 places to the left, and that's why we end up with 128 printed down here. ASF has an inbuilt 16 by 16 matrix of pads, which we refer to as the pixel grid. It's both an input grid and also a visualizer. We can receive messages from it with the pixel grid callback, but we can also set it with the ASF set pixel grid function. So let's see this in action. First of all, open up ASF, and on the right hand side you will see the pixel grid. If this is showing as bit grid or does not look right proportionally, then you may need to download the latest version of ASF. We are currently using ASF version 2.1. Resize this so we can have this on the right hand side. To set ASERV's pixel grid, type ASERV set to pixel grid. Notice there is only two arguments. The row that we the row that you want to set, in this case I'll set the first row, so zero. And this arbitrary value. What this value is, is a 16-bit representation of this. So remember this has 16 individual states, and the way this is set is that each individual button is represented by a single bit within our binary representation of this value. Okay, so what this means is if I put the value 255 in there, we should set the first 8 bits of this row to be 1. So yeah, the first, sorry, the first, the, fir the, right, the right 8 buttons, if you like, are now all turned on. Um, we can try a couple of things in here, so let's try 1, and this time we'll shift this up by 8 places. So this will now set the top, eight, uh, the top 8 buttons to also be 1. If you want to set an individual button, we would do we could use the following kind of formula. We'd say one shift by the number of places, basically the button that we wish to write to. So if we want to turn the first button on, sorry, the, the button on the right hand side on, if I refer to it as the first button, it's the button on the right hand side. Then we do one shift zero. If we wanted to uh, turn the topmost, so the f the leftmost button on, uh, we would do one shift fifteen. Also, one thing to note is that the pixel grid retains its state between callback, uh, between program runs. It does not clear itself in the same way that uh, pressing the reset button does. So let's quickly use what we've just learned to make a kind of pretty pattern. So we'll create a for loop. We'll say in i is zero, and i is less than sixteen. I plus plus, and then we're going to say a serve set pixel grid. We'll set this to be i, and then we're going to do one shift by i. Okay, so let's quickly test this. So let's put a breakpoint on here so we can watch this uh, kind of go around line by line. Okay, so the first time this should run, of course, I will be zero. So we want to set the first row, which is fine. And we want to say one shift by zero. One shift by zero basically doesn't do anything. So the value one will be placed on this row, which means only the right hand side button uh, will be lit up. Likewise, when we come around again, we're going to do one shift by one, which means this is going to move up by one place. So this row is going to have this value. And like we can continue this all the way down until we finish our grid, like so. Okay, let's also quickly, while we're here, look at how we would use the, the, the bit grid callback. So let's uh, comment this out for a second. And remember, we need to put this now back into its wild true state. 
so that the program will wait for us to use the callbacks. And then if we navigate to the .h file and uncomment the callback pixel grid, let's copy this and paste this in here, delete the, uh, delete the semicolon, add two braces, and finally put IAP uh, dot dot in front of it. What we're going to do just to, just to see that this is working, we'll just print out the x and y coordinates that uh, we receive. So x is x, followed by a line, and y is uh, y. Uh, what have I done wrong? Missing a uh, operator there. Okay, so when I click this grid now, you should see that I'm the kind of x is updating as I so y is updating as I go down the page, uh, and x is updating as I go along the page, which is fine. So over this would be fifteen, fifteen, and this is zero, zero. What we're wondering is why is it that when I click a button here, the the grid itself does not update. And the reason for this is the kind of the interface, which is i.e. the things that you click and the visual output are both essentially decoupled. And there's lots of reasons for doing this, um, which we'll explore as we kind of make applications for the pixel grid itself. But let's quickly, as I click a button, what I'll do is I'll make it so that this button itself uh, lights up. And so we'll use the same kind of the, the basically the same bit of code we used before. So a subset pixel grid. Uh, let's clear the let's clear this out. So a subset pixel grid. Let's type the whole line again. A subset pixel grid. Uh, the row will be uh, the y value, and of course the value is going to be x. Uh, so one shift by x. Let's see what this does. So now when I click this, you should see that something happens, but this is the wrong way around. Uh, and that's because remember that the the binary representation means that uh, this is our zero, uh, basically our first bit, so bit number zero, and this is bit number 15. Um, so what we want to do uh, is we want to invert our kind of x values. So what we'll do is we'll just say x equals uh, 15 minus x, which will essentially flip x the other way around. And so now hopefully when I toggle that, we should be able to at least set one bit on each on each row. You might be wondering, well, why does it why does it only work for kind of for one row at a time? Um, and we're going to come on to why that is in just a moment, and we'll find a solution for that uh, in due course. But let's now return to the lecture slides. Bitwise AND is very similar to the AND AND operator that we've used previously. Bitwise AND computes the AND logical operator between each bit of two variables. And likewise, the bitwise OR, again being very similar to the logical OR, computes the OR logical operator between each bit of two variables. Again, we'll use the bitwise, we'll use the bit grid to see this in action. So let's open our, brick, our bit grid up. So inside here, again, let's, set, let's, just, let's just test this with AND. So if I put these three to be one, and these three to be one, then if I put and if I press and here, you'll see that in this is so this is this is our variable one, our second variable, and this would be our output of these two variables with the and operator applied. We can see that because these are all off and these are all off, but these are all one and these are all one, we end up with this pattern. Again, let's just let's just to prove this works, we'll just clear these two bits here and we'll do the same thing again. We see that the and 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 are this, because and uh, requires both inputs to be true, we end up with false. And again here we end up with false. But because both of these are set to one, we end up with uh, true, so we end up with a one in the output. But if we were to do the or of this, we would see because either one of these is true, we end up with uh, true in the output. So just think of the and and or as the same as the logical and and or, except it goes through each individual bit, compares that, and that's what gives you the output. There are two other bitwise operators that you um, will also see, but these are less common than the other two. Um, this is the bitwise not, which is quite self-explanatory. It would go through and invert uh, each bit in a single number. So this works with just one variable, not with two, and it will go through the variable. And if there's a if uh, for each binary kind of represent each binary digit, if it's a one, it flips it to a zero, and if it's a zero, it flips it to a one. Um, the bitwise XOR is, uh, works with two variables, and it computes computes the exclusive OR between two of them. We can see the bitwise XOR in the a binary grid application. So let's just toggle a few of these to be one and see what happens. Um, compute the XOR and you can see that in, with XOR if if both values are zero you end up with a zero in the output. If one value is one you end up with a one in the output but if both values are one you end up with a zero in the output. To check to see if an individual bit is set we can use this formula which is basically if a, a being our input variable, bitwise and one shift by x where x is the bit that we want to check. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to create two variables. I'm going to create a variable called a. I'm going to set this. E I'm going to set this so that it's equal to um, this. So I, want, I basically want to set all of the bits except the top one, so 127. 
Again, you can use the binary grid to kind of help you out with these, uh, with kind of, you can use the binary grid to help you out with these kind of operations. So A is 127. In this case, I'm going to set B to be one shift by seven places. Now, if we clear this, let's clear this grid completely and actually see what one shift by seven is. So one shift by seven will give us 128. Okay. And then so using our formula, in this case, we're going to now going to say if A uh, bitwise B, let's check to see. So let's say we'll say uh, to see out the topmost the uh, eighth bit, but <laughs> bit is set. So this is basically this formula, but I've just split it onto two lines to make it easier. So let's see what happens when I run this. A whole lot of nothing. Um, and we can break this down and see why this is the case. So let's go back to our binary grid and let's see this in action. So remember, let's flip this the right way around. Okay, so A in this case is 127. So that means that all of these are set. Okay, and B is one shift by seven places. So that's that. And if we look at the bitwise and of that, we see that nothing happens. Okay, so that's why that when we run this, um, we don't get this message printed. The eighth bit is set because the eighth bit is not set. However, let's do one shift by six. And we'll change our message accordingly. Uh, we can now see that the seventh bit is set, and that's right because now A is still 127, but B is now 64. Okay, and we did the and y and of that, and we end up with 64. And because 64 is essentially not zero, um, this if statement is true, and we can check to see the seventh. We can check and prove that the seventh bit is set. So again, this is the generic formula, and this is it in action. And just to make this a little bit shorter, we'll do the kind of shorthand way of doing this. Okay, and that would be functionally equivalent. So this this kind of if statement is checking to see if bit 7 is set. And remember, it's bit 7 because we start, we kind of subtract 1 when we do, when we do a bit shift. So if we want to check the first bit was set, this would be 1 shift 0. If we want to check the second bit is set, this would be 1 shift 1, and so forth. And there's two other things, there's kind of two other I guess bit toggling operations that we want to look at. Uh, the first of these is how we would set a bit. So to set a bit, the formula is kind of it's kind of similar. And um, we would say a equals a bitwise or one shift x. So let's see this uh, in action. And I'll just demonstrate this in the uh, binary grid. So let's say this is our let's say we our input variable in this case is 14 has the value 14, and I want to set this bit specifically. So using our formula, let's say that. Um, this is a and our one shift x will be here so let's put bit one let's put set essentially the first bit to be true and we're going to shift it up by um, four places and then we do the bitwise or of this we now see that the output is essentially these two numbers added together and we end up with 30. so remember the bitwise or is um, is true as long as one of these is true and let's also just do this in code to prove that this um, this works so we'll set a to be uh, 14 and then we'll say a, um, in fact, let's we can we'll leave this formula as it is. So we still want to check to see if the uh, one zero one two three four the fourth bit is set. But we'll also do a uh, equals a or um, one shift by four. So this basically will update a so that it's uh, it's fifth bit is set. We'll check the debugger again. Okay, so in A, you can see that it has the bit pattern 0111, which it has here, 0111. From, I'm reading that um, stupidly from uh, right to left, but anyway. And then we follow, execute this line of code, and you can see that then that kind of the fifth bit has now been toggled to one, which means our uh, if statement will print, although it should also say fifth rather than seventh. But hopefully, uh, you can see that in action. Okay, and then. To clear a bit is another kind of, this is quite a horribly complicated formula, but it's basically it's kind of the same as the kind of checking a bit, but it's the opposite. So A equals A, uh, bitwise and, with the bitwise not of one shift by X. Uh, luckily, you don't need to remember this formula. This formula is provided uh, in the tutorial handout materials that are on GitHub. Um, but I'll demonstrate here just to show, to show you that it works. Um, so based on what we had before, let's say we've got in our binary grid, we have this operation here. Sorry, this value here. So we have a is fourteen, and let's say we want to clear the, let's say we want to clear this bit to bit number three. So we'll do a is um, and um, bit not of one shift by two places. 
So this will clear the bit. This will clear uh, bit three, and then we'll just check to see if it's it should this should no longer be true, right? Because bit um, three is clear. Again, put the breakpoint. Uh, put the debugger on. Okay, so looking at this again, we have uh, one 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 zero. And then we have now we have clip one zero one zero because we cleared bit number three and this means this won't print because bit three is no longer set now you understand how to set clear and check the bits we can now kind of compute our program so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create this 16 element array to store the state of the grid to do this we'll make this a shared variable so we stood array make it of type int and we'll give it 16 places and we'll just call this uh, let's call this pixel Oop, pixel grid state. I'll we'll set it all to zero. So by default, it has uh, it's all full of zeros. Okay, now we do one of three things on this when our callback uh, pixel grid is called. The first thing we want to do is we want to check to see if the bit is already set. So we're going to do if pixel grid state. Remember y is our row, so we'll say go for this row, and then we're going to do our and. Let's refer to our lecture slide to make sure to see where this is coming from to check a bit if a and bitwise uh, so a being our in this case will be our pixel grid state a uh, one shift x is going to be one quite literally shift x okay so remember x is our x position y is our row so if it's already set then we need to clear it so to clear it we'll look at that to to check to see if it's clear we'll do this i'm just going to copy this and then paste that in there and then what i'm going to do is say pixel grid state equals pixel grid state, remember to set this to be y, sorry, y and y, so it equals itself, bitwise and, not uh, one shift up x. Okay, so that will clear, that will clear that, that will clear it. Okay, else, we'll do the, uh, we'll set the bit. So to reiterate what we're doing here, we're saying if the bit is already set, then we want to clear it, if not, we will set the bit. So again, we'll just nick this bit of code. So a equals a, in this case, pixel grid state of y equals pixel grid state of y. Bitwise or one shift up by x. And the last thing we would need to do in this case is we need to go through and we need to say a serve set pixel grid y with pixel grid state y. Because if we've adjusted that row, we then need to update that row. And let's just check to see if this works. Okay, so when we hit, the, when we now click on the grid, we should see that it updates, and this time the positions are retaining themselves. And once again, they're back to front. So we need to do the same thing we did last time, which we'll do, uh, which is x equals x, uh, x equals 15 minus x. So again, we need to invert x so that it, I mean, it's the right way around. Let's try again. Cool. And this time we can go through and click as many kind of buttons, I guess, as you like, and the state of the buttons uh, are retained on the grid. Do remember that when we stop the program and we run it. Uh, the grid itself does not automatically clear. Um, to do that, you might want us to create a little loop like this at the start. So we'll make a quick, a quick loop to, to clear the grid. To clear the grid. I plus plus a serve set pixel grid row, i and zero. And each time our program runs, it means that it will reset that grid. And there you go. It's completely reset. It. MIDI messages are a good example of needing bitwise operations. The messages themselves are tiny and often contain more than one piece of information. Raw MIDI messages consist of three bytes, and there are exceptions to this, such as SysX, but we're not going to cover that on this module. We refer to these bytes as the status byte, data1, and data2. Let's print these in real time. Let's go back to Xcode, and we're going to uncomment the callback MIDI received callback. We're going to copy this, and we're going to paste this into our CPP, and add it like so. Now, if we look at our callback MIDI received, it passes this custom thing, custom data type called MIDI. So let's have a look at this by going command click and then jump to definition. And we'll see that this, this uh, class has three uh, public member variables, status, data1, and data2. Let's print these out. So it's did see out, message, uh, data1. Sorry, we'll start with status. Status, message, uh, dot data1. Uh, message dot data two and finally backslash n. Oh, and of course we need to make sure we put a little our run loop back in. So while true, a serve sleep for one millisecond. Okay, so now whenever we hit a key on uh, 
inside our inside a serve you'll notice that each of these kind of gives us a different type of message so you can kind of see that all of our note messages are coming through with the status byte set as 144 our controllers are coming through with 176 um, the pitch bent so pitch bend should be something completely different yep 224 uh, and I think that's it for this keyboard there are a few other messages but we'll come back to that in just a second but as you can see um, everything's being sent through this callback MIDI received um, you may be wondering why we use the callback MIDI received rather than just using um, these three things uh, sorry, the, the four callbacks that we normally have is basically there is kind of more information that can be sent through the callback MIDI received so this can actually receive um, any type of MIDI message bar the sysx message so as we saw in the example we had we were receiving three messages from ASAP and these were the status byte the data one and data two the status byte tells us two things. It tells us the message type, i.e. what type of MIDI message it is, and also the MIDI channel that it was sent on. Um, so the status byte is essentially made of two four-bit uh, kind of pieces of information, and the upper four bits are referred to as the message type, and the lower four bits are the channel number. Um, and because these are sent in one kind of piece, in one variable, we basically need to use some bitwise stuff to split this out. So to demonstrate this, let's go into, again, back into the callback message. Uh, and to get the status, so let's start with the Let's start with the lower four bits and show you how to get the channel number. So to do this, we're going to make a variable called int chan. We're going to set this equal to message uh, status. And then what we're going to do is if we look at our, let's imagine for a moment where's our binary group gone. So like I said, our um, status byte, the first, these are like the lower four bits are going to tell us which channel number it is. And let's say we want, so we only really want, we only really want this, these four bits of information. And so what we need to do is we need to basically mask off and get rid of these top four bits. And so the way we're going to do this is simply by saying um, this. So we're going to make a variable, set it equal to 15. And then we're going to say whatever our channel, so we're going to say um, message status, which remember is, uh, is this, followed by this variable that we're going to create, which we're going to set to 15 and do bitwise and. So let's say, for example, our channel is uh, channel 2, bitwise and, we get 2 down here. So regardless to what's set at the top here, you see we're only ever going to get the channel, we're only ever going to isolate these four bits. So to do that, we're just going to say message and status, bitwise and 15. So number 15 is these four uh, bits set. So this will give us the channel number, and what about getting the message type? So we'll type int message type equals message, and then we're going to go, again, get the status byte. But this time we're going to do something slightly different. So remember, our message type is in the top four bits. And so one easy way of just getting those top four bits out is just to downshift it by four. So we do status, uh, shift by four places to the right. So now we've done this, let's print these two pieces of information out. So make a stud C out. And we'll say uh, channel is equal to this. So chan. Uh, followed by uh, mess. And then type, again, is equal to message type. Okay, let's check that this works. Okay, so let's go back to uh, ASAV. And then we push the MIDI keyboard. We'll see that the channel is zero and the type of message is message type number nine. And hopefully if you push the drum pads, you should see that um, they get pushed through on different channel. Um, so the message type is the same. They're both no on messages, um, but the channel type, uh, the channel has changed. So the, the keyboard should send on channel zero uh, and the drum pads themselves should send on channel number nine. You might be wondering how I knew it was a note on message. Well, this kind of list here, um, so that if this is the top, remember these are the, remember this number represents the top four bits of that uh, status byte because it's split into the message type and the channel. So if it has the byte, the basic, the binary pattern one, zero, 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 it's a note off. Um, but there's quite a few different message types. You have note off and note on. And we don't tend to see the note off message type in, in this module because everything is sent on the note on. Uh, and this is a bit confusing because there is two types of note off message. So there's a note off message type. Uh, and there's also a note on message type with the velocity of zero, which is also equivalent to a note off. Um, it's slightly confusing. And if you're more interested, I suggest uh, reading about it kind of in your own time. But yeah, don't worry too much about note off, just worry about uh, kind of note on messages. Um, the next one up is the polyphonic aftertouch, and this is very rare. Very few keyboards have this, um, so you're not likely to see it. Uh, the next message type is channel change, uh, sorry, control change, which again, uh, is, you've seen this quite a lot. It's all the rotary controls and dials. Uh, program change, so the impulse doesn't send any of these. It does have a send channel pressure. Um, and this is when you push the key down and you continue to push it down, then the, pro the, the key will start sending the pressure of which you've applied uh, to the key. However, this is for all keys. So if you push down five keys at once, it will just kind of, depending on how it's implemented, it may just send kind of an average of those five pressures, or it might just send the last one that was, the last one that was updated. Uh, pitch bend, again, is the one after that. And then finally, system exclusive is the one after, is the last one of those, uh, last, the last one of those.
And system exclusive is the last one of those. But again, we're not going to worry about system exclusive for now. So apart from the status byte, data one and data two are context sensitive depending on the message type. So with a note or message, uh, data one is the note number and data two is the velocity. Um, with program change, uh, data one is the program you want to change to, but data two itself is not used. Um, data one and data two only use the seven bits and the top bit is always zero. So essentially this is why you end up with a MIDI message only having the range zero to 127 um, because they only use the, the, the lower seven bits, they don't use the top bit. Pitch band is really unique because it uses both uh, data one and data two um, because the pitch band is represented by a 14 bit number. Um, so the, it's a lot more precision because you have 16,384 values which is two to the power of 14 uh, rather than just zero to 127. Um, and if you want to, if you, I mean, you can use the callback pitch bend um, for this purpose, or if you want to decode the raw MIDI, you could, um, you would have to combine both data one and data two using binary operations. Um, so why do I need to know all of this? Why am I worrying, even worrying about kind of binary and MIDI and all this low level stuff? Uh, generally speaking, most high level application, uh, kind of high level software, so the application level, they don't, the developers don't need to worry about low level binary applications for the, for the most part. However, audio MIDI is a bit of an edge case, um, especially MIDI if you're writing any kind of low-level MIDI applications like we're doing, uh, then you do need to know how to decode and split MIDI messages. Um, I've, also had, I've also had interview questions that were based on uh, binary operations. If you want to implement pressure in your assignment, then you will need to use the raw MIDI uh, decoding. I'll leave that up to you to how to work that one out, because um, you'll get marks in the assignment if you do that. Um, some other uses of kind of raw MIDI, uh, some other uses of kind of bitwise manipulation are uh, file types. So if you've got a type of file, then the data itself might be compressed in that file. So if you're opening and kind of working with um, some other uses of binary are stuff like file types. So we, in our previous lecture, we looked at how we'd write a text to file, which is a plain text file. But more than often than not, you will actually just want to write kind of numerical data. Uh, and for that, you'll turn that data into a binary stream and you'll write that to a binary file. Um, and depending on how you want to kind of pack that data, which kind of brings on to our next point, um, if you've got lots of data, um, but you're only using kind of small, so let's say you're only using the bottom eight bits of an integer number, then it makes sense that you only write those eight bits of the number to file. And this is kind of how data compression kind of works. It gets rid of the kind of entropy uh, and makes the data smaller. A lot of networking stuff is sent over using um, kind of packets, and these can be quite small. And the data generally is kind of bit mass, so you've got lots of bits of data in a single variable. A lot of legacy code worked with, bin uh, with binary. If you were limited, sorry, with, yeah, with binary uh, manipulation. Let's say, for example, in a lot of older systems uh, where RAM was quite expensive and you didn't have much of it or you didn't have much memory, then you did have to kind of compress data into, into essentially smaller numbers. Um, so yeah, you had to kind of, the CPU would do more work in terms of how to decode the, the binary representation, but the RAM, because you didn't have much of it, was kind of, let, you know, you had more CPU and less RAM to play with, essentially. And of course, if you're like me and you like emulation, then you'll need to know about uh, low-level stuff for doing emulation. Just kind of just before we go, um, we've talked about we talked about everything being represented by binary, which which is true. However, most stuff is represented kind of in a simple binary representation, like integers and things like that. Um, but floats do have this kind of they're a bit of an edge case. They have a much more complex binary representation than almost all other data types. Um, so if this if you had a 32-bit float, which is the standard float, so four bytes, um, it's basically split into three parts, which is the sign bit, which tells you whether it's positive or negative. Um, you have the exponent, which is eight bits, and you have the mantissa, which is 23 bits. Um, I won't explain to you uh, how this is represented. You don't really need to know about it at this level. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, then please go ahead and look it up. So the main in-class activity is we're going to build a drum slash note step sequencer. We'll keep the same toggle logic from the previous exercise, but we'll add a loop. We'll add a loop for stepping over each step. We add another loop for checking each row. And essentially, if that kind of step is highlighted, we would trigger a note, and then we'd sleep for a bit. OK, so I'm going to kind of demonstrate this uh, this concept but just by having kind of one row of our sequencer. So inside our while true loop, I'm going to create a for loop. Again, I'm going to set the sequence to i and set it equal to 0, less than 16, and i++. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through essentially kind of each step within our row. So remember our in our binary grid, sorry, not binary grid, in our, our pixel grid on here, let's get rid of this application for a moment. We've got, our code is currently set so that whenever we click a button on this grid, make sure this is running. So whenever our code is running, when we have a click, whenever we click a button on the grid, you can see that it's updating and storing its state. Um, and it's stored in this, this pixel grid state array. So what we could do is, because we've stored this in this pixel grid state array, we could look through this and check at each position, essentially, if it's set. And if it is, if it is set, we could 
for example, trigger a drum sample. So let's do the same kind of thing again. So if pixel grid, and I'm just going to take the first row for it as an example. Um, if it and uh, one shift by i. So basically, is set. Then I'm going to trigger a sample. A serve play sample. I just need to remember to I need to load the samples as well. So A serve load uh, default sounds. And one last thing we need to do before we run this, of course, is put an A serve sleep in here. Otherwise, this will run uh, very, very, very quickly, which we do not want to happen. In fact, we need to put that there. We need to sleep after each step. Okay, so let's try this again. And once again, this is actually running backwards, so we'll switch this around to run forwards. By doing this, let's try that again. Cool. So we can see that that's working. So this is give give you this is kind of the basic concept that you need to build the to build the drum sequencer. Uh, for this week's practical. Have a think about how you might extend this. Let's turn this off. Have a think about how you might extend this to work for every row, because at the minute we're just making this work for one row. Have a think how you might essentially expand this to work for multiple rows, so that you can have 16 steps. Uh, you might think about having the top four steps for drums and the bottom uh, 12 steps to be a um, an oscillator. And once you've essentially completed this exercise, you should end up with something like this. Where your top four, where your top uh, top rows of drum hits. I'm just going to make something really random. And your bottom your bottom rows are uh, a are a synthesizer. Yeah, doesn't sound particularly elegant, but hopefully this demonstrates the kind of demonstrates what it is that you should achieve by uh, by doing this week's tutorial. The kind of once you've done all the exercises this week, the debug exercise will be snake, which again I'll demonstrate in just a moment you should end up with something like this, which is a um, little snake game that I've created for you. Um, so you get given the code for this. This is really hard to play while talking to you. Um, but you get given the code for this and it doesn't work. Um, and the odd idea is to try and fix this and make this work. But once, yeah, so basically once you fi once you fix the broken code, you should end, up, should end up with a working game of snake. Although, like I said, it's really hard to play uh, while talking to you. But yeah, anyway. Again, if you have any questions, I mean, this is obviously a video lecture. Uh, you can feel free to email me or you can leave a comment in the video and I'll try and get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you for listening.